pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. As we open up your scriptures, we pray that you would, again, show us the way that we can be loving, that we can honor the truth, and we can honor you in our relationships with one another. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> thought we'd done that quickly. Um, when I was younger, going shopping with my parents, I would always see a magazine in the stand. <clears throat> it was an amazing magazine. It was called The Weekly World. And every, every time you see it, they discover some amazing thing. Bigfoot had been found. UFOs had been meeting with the president. Um, Loch Ness Monster had been discovered. Amazing, wonderful things. And it was the black and white. It was just black and white. It was one of those tabloids. Did you remember the weekly world seeing it in the, in, the, in the stands? I guess I was at eye level oftentimes. Now, of course, my parents would never let me buy such useless garbage. But my great aunt did. <laughs> June... 1992, Bat Boy had been discovered in the caves of West Virginia. A two-foot-tall creature, half man, half bat, with big eyes, pointy ears, a huge mouth with sharp teeth, who would run around the caves and catch flies and eat them, had been discovered and captured by scientists. An amazing discovery. Of course, it was fake. Back then, we could tell what was real and what was fake. If it was in the weekly world, it was fake. It was pretty easy. We're living in an age, though, where we're starting to hear this blurring of lines between what is real and what is fake. What is real news? What is fake news? What is, what is factual? What is optional? What is idea? Is it okay to quote an erroneous story? It's, there's a lot going on in our society with this. We keep hearing about our election, about what's being reported, uh, trumped up stories about Charlottesville made up stories about other things. We're getting to a point where with our technology, we can actually construct a fake news. We've already seen it with Photoshop of taking something and putting it in a picture and making it fake. But there's technology now where uh, you can have a picture of someone on television and, and they can take, uh, I think it's called motion capture technology, where they can basically take the motion from my face and put it on a face on the screen. And we have people with technology that are creating the ability to, to make someone's voice and mimic someone's voice. So we could have videos of people who are never there saying things they never said. And unless you are highly uh, skilled in seeing the difference, you may not even know that it's a fake. We're getting to a point in our society where we're having this struggle. Back in last, well, last Sunday, I told you about how in 1966, Time magazine put out an, an article or a cover that has asked the question, is God dead? This year, back in March, Time magazine put out another article which asked, is truth dead? Do you have that one up there on the screen? Ask this question, is truth dead? Because they, we said we're living in a culture where we're no longer being able to determine what is truth. That's a question that's been asked a lot. How do we discover truth? What is reality? It's a question our philosophers have pondered. Our movies have, have asked us. Our scientists are even beginning to say we're part of some great computer program that's running in the cosmos. This question goes way back. Even Pontius Pilate, when questioning Jesus, said, What is truth? It's a question that some will say will shift from generation to generation. What is true today wasn't true 40, 50, 60 years ago. And what was true then wasn't true 80, 90, 100 years ago. Our scripture today is going to remind us of the importance of clinging to truth. And what exactly is the truth that we should cling to? There are three basic focuses of today's scripture. Truth, love, and hospitality. And how those things relate to one another. Look with me now in 2 John. Let's just go ahead and, and we'll break it up into smaller chunks. We're going to get through the whole chapter today, but we will uh, break it up into sections. It says, To the elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, 
and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. This is a fairly standard greeting with a little bit of difference. One, you see that John does not say that John is the one writing it. It has been well um, accepted throughout church history that this was indeed John writing this. He was probably up in years, so this is not only a, a title position, but also just a statement of his age. He has described himself as the elder. And then there's the, he wrote it to the elect lady. There's been debate after debate after study after commentary on who the elect lady is. It basically boils down to two possible options. Either this was an individual woman who was writing to about her family, or it is language to represent a church talking about the congregation. We'll look at it a little bit from both fronts. The truth is we don't know exactly which one it was, but it's either an individual or to a body of believers, much like we would be today. Um, the reason that he may have written with the words the, to the elder to the elect lady was because this was a time of persecution and should this letter get out to people who were um, seeking to hunt down Christians it could have tipped them off to one where John was and to who this person was or where this congregation was and then they would be able to find them and, and take them into to jail or to torture them so we have a little bit of, of hiddenness for protection he says that uh, he, he is um, he loves them in truth not only he but also all who know the truth because the truth that abides in us will be with us forever. He gives this promise. He says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. These themes are repetitive for John. If you read 1 John, you'll see these themes of truth and love are paramount. We've already begun to discuss truth a little bit, and, and he was very important to him that the true message of the gospel was being declared. That's what John was focusing on. Let's continue reading. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This was an encouragement to him. This is a reminder for us. This is nothing new. Love one another. This is nothing that's, that's going to make anybody say, oh, I've never heard that before. We're supposed, we're supposed to love one another? We're supposed to treat each other well and care for one another and put one another first and try to meet each other's needs? I hadn't realized that. We know this. Even when John wrote this, he realized that the person or the church he was writing to knew this, but he was reminding them. Partially, it was an encouragement. It was a, we've heard this, I've seen that your children are walking in the truth. Remind them that they are to love one another. Love in that day was a little different than the love we have today because love also carried with it action. We have the ability, I guess you'd say, in our day and age where we can love something without ever really engaging with it. And that's not really love, but, but it's what we say. I mean, we love all kinds of things. We love pizza. We love, we love a television show. We love a movie stars, all these other things that we can say we love. But love that we're talking about in the Bible is love that carries with it action. Love that carries with it, with it um, involvement. And so when he says to this church or this lady, we are to love one another, there's a, there's a sense that we must interact with one another. And we must help one another. And I'll go into that helping one another a little bit more as we talk about hospitality. But let us remember that one of the chief rules, if you will, or commandments that Jesus gave to his disciples was to love one another. We're told that the way that they will, we, we will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ, or the way that the world will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ, is how? By our love for one another. When the world looks at us, when the world looks and says, is that person a believer in Jesus Christ, 
They don't try to see how many Bible verses that person can quote. They don't try to see how many times that person goes to church. They don't try to see how many hymns that person knows or how much Christian radio that person listens to or how much how the clothes that they wear, the, mo- the, the way that the world looks at us and says, is that person a follower of Jesus Christ? Is, are they showing love to other people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ? Our church is places where membership can be seen to care about each other. I think this church, we see that. And we see it not just in words, we see it in action. We see men taking time out of their lives to go build ramps for other church members. We see women and families cooking meals for people who are hurting. We hear the request of updates for people who are sick and injured. We have a community that loves each other and that is good and we need to grow that and foster that and repeat that and encourage that sometimes we don't always feel like loving our fellow church members I was going to see if there was an amen I'm glad there wasn't but I was just going to wait and see and give you the opportunity we don't always feel like loving our church member but we are told that as we relate to one another we aren't perfect people and we are going to have to have times of sacrifice and reaching out and caring and if we do have a confrontation with someone there ought to be a reconciliation also I'm stepping away from the scripture for a moment but I'm, I'm leaning into other scriptures there ought to be forgiveness and there ought to be restoration so that the relationship can continue so that the church can heal and I'm not speaking just of this church but of all churches love is something that engages love is something that truly cares and has to relate to one another verse 6 and this is love also verse 6 and this is love that we walk according to his commandments love obeys think about the the story that, that buddy told the children there were two boys the father said go pick the vineyard and the first the first son said yes daddy I'll go do it or maybe the first child said no I'm not gonna do that forget about it and the second son said yes daddy I'll go harvest the vineyard and the father comes back and the one that said no I won't do it goes out and harvests and the one that said yes I'll do it he didn't and the father was of course pleased with the one who had actually done what the father told him to do so many times we read in the scripture we're supposed to do something and we say oh that's wonderful God is so good but then we don't do it we are told many things in our Christian walk that we are to do but then we don't obey John reminds these people that to love and this is love verse 6 that we walk according to his commandments this is the commandment, just as you had heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. And the reason it's so important to walk in truth and to follow what God says and to know what truth is and to follow after these teachings is because of verse 7. It says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such as one is the deceiver and the antichrist. You had a few things going on at this point in history within the church there were people there was a group of people called Gnostics who believed that all life was wrapped up in 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 knowledge or secret knowledge that the physical world and when I say the physical world I mean anything you could touch was actually evil it was it was to be discarded your your flesh was evil your your clothes were, were evil or unclean anything material was was to be rejected and at one point we'd all just sort of be intellect and and that Jesus when he when he returns he is not going to come in in a physical form it's all just spiritual and 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 other than the flesh there were others who would preach there was no resurrection to come those would be the Sadducees they probably there's no real resurrection you need to worry about um, once you die you're dead that's it there's not going to be you're never going to come back to life you're just dead then there were some who had who were brought into the fold of Christianity they were taught that Jesus died and rose again and he said one day I will return and that we all will be 
will be resurrected and we will get a glorified body like Christ had, a glorified body after his re resurrection. He was the first fruits of the fruits that was to come, which will be the saints. All of us were saved. We will have this new, cre this new glorified body. And some heard that and were beginning to learn that and rejected that premise. And then they would go out teaching and trying to say to other Christians, no, that's, that's not really the truth. It's actually going to be either Jesus is going to return, but it's only going to be spiritual. There's no real bodily resurrection. And they would, they would not hide it under Gnosticism or under, or under the uh, Jewish Sadducee, but they would claim to be both believers but also reject the glorified resurrected body of Christ and his physical return. Now, for some of you, you know, that just sort of, you, you hear that and you think, well, why is that relevant to me today? Here's why it's relevant. Because that is the promise of Jesus Christ. That is the promise that we all cling to. If you're here today, if you're sitting in this room today, the truth of the scriptures and that there is an actual resurrection, not just that your soul lives forever, but you, are a, you become a new creation, if you will. That is the promise on which we lean upon. That is what we hold to, is this physical resurrection. And John says that some were denying it. But if you're denying that, then, then what is our hope in, if not a resurrection? And some people were going around and they were trying to spread this lie. So the question sort of becomes, how do we, who know the truth, who are encouraged to love one another, how do we deal with people who are spreading and teaching error? In the early church, this was a real problem because of the guidelines that had been laid out in other chapters. Missionaries were beginning to go out and spread the good news. And if a missionary came into your city or came into your town, the, the, the teaching was that you should invite them into your home and let them spend the night and, and collect money so that they could go out and continue on with their ministries. You know, we, we, do, we, we don't just invite people into our homes so much, but just like we did with our, with our um, North Carolina Baptist on missions for a solid month, we collected money so that we could send to people who are helping with disaster relief. We get the principle of collecting extra to help those who are serving. They had the same kind of principle back then. Uh, gather the Christians together, um, collect money to aid those who are spreading the gospel. But in addition to that, they would say, come and spend the night at my house. Uh, eat, eat at my table. Let's fellowship together. And, and let me pray and support you as you go on your ministry. Greet in this context was more than just a how do you do. It was a welcoming into your home. And Christians were told to do that for one another. He says this in verse 8. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Is this person as good as they are, as kind as they are, as humble as they are, as much scripture as they know, as much teaching as they know, as genuine as their heart is, if they do not abide in the teaching of Christ they do not have God whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son verse 10 if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works now again this word greet whenever we think of greet we think hello hello That's there, there's more to the greeting here it was a it was a fellowship it was a come into my home and and dine with me kind of thing and a very standard or, or common way we encounter this from time to time we have people who are teaching an alternative faith who will ride through our neighborhoods and come to our doors and try and and, and give us small pamphlets of information and and i'm thinking of jehovah's witness as they come and they travel Many of you may have seen them riding their bicycles around lately. Maybe they've come to your door. How do we respond to them as Christians? I'll tell you how sometimes we respond to it. Everybody get quiet. Turn out the lights. The Jehovah's Witnesses are outside. Act like we're not home. Turn out the lights. Shh, shh. That's how sometimes we respond. 
sometimes we'll open the door, we'll say, hey, how you doing? And they'll try to give us the watchtower, and you may take it, you may not, uh, and, or you may say, no, I don't believe that, thank you so much, and you'll shut the door. We question, what do we do? Or sometimes, the, uh, another approach might be taken, sometimes you might actually try to flip the script and evangelize them. I think that's a wonderful opportunity, you know, to try, to try and, and witness to them. But here's the thing, if you aren't, if you're not, mature in your faith and you're still learning God's word and you're still in your and you're maybe you're you're a, you're new to the faith I would encourage you to just say thanks but no thanks and close the door that's not being rude that's not being unloving that is is you protecting your family that is what let's say this was an individual woman that, that John was writing to this is him saying you need to protect your children don't invite them in don't support their ministry because you're actually taking part in what they're doing. If you're a mature believer and, and you, you, you have a solid foundation in God's word, you can engage more intently and try to witness to them. But otherwise, it is appropriate to close the door. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to slam the door in their face. But what about family members? What about, what about someone who you've grown up with? The still principle rings true. You can, you can be kind, but not be supportive of the error. Love in this passage, this true love to obey, this love that comes to us from the Father, this grace, mercy, and peace that comes to us, does not mean that we have to let any garbage that we hear into our minds. Now, I chose Jehovah's Witness as a very distinct purpose, but how about other things that are teaching error? See, a lot of us would never let a Jehovah's Witness come in and try and have Bible study with our family, but we turn on our televisions and we let error flood into our homes. We let television shows that preach, uh, preach. It may not be someone standing in from a pulpit, but they definitely have a message that they're presenting to you. And you turn on the TV and you let that garbage flood into your home. And your children turn on the television. And, 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 and Disney Channel Parents is no longer a safe haven. There are messages that are being presented on those shows that are contrary to God's teaching. There are songs on the radio that are contrary to the holiness of who God is. And we'll slam the door and hide from the Jehovah's Witness, but we will welcome that error into our lives. You need to be careful. You need to be protecting your family. You need to be careful what you watch and who you listen to and what they have to say to you. Because if they're talking about who God is or who Jesus is and they don't hold to this and they don't follow the resurrection and they don't teach about obeying Christ, then they are following a different path and they are not to be supported and they are not to be welcomed. This principle could be expanded. Now, as you expand it, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Again, thinking back to when I was a child, does anyone remember when the, the Baptist, Southern Baptist boycotted Disney? Anybody remember that? We're not going to go. We're not going to do that. Anybody, Katie, remembers? There was, a, there was a, big, a big push for all Southern Baptists. Don't do anything Disney. Don't go to Disney. It was don't, don't buy their merchandise, don't do any of that. Well, then when you find out all the Disney's operating, that all Disney operates, it's like, well, we can't do anything. You know, if I, if I, if I buy a, a Tigger stuffed animal because, you know, Disney owns the Winnie the, rights to Winnie the Pooh, does that mean I'm supporting everything they do? It becomes convoluted when we start talking about our money. Uh, many of you are upset about what's going on in the NFL right now, and you want to protest, and you want to boycott. Well, if you're going to boycott the NFL, you've also got to look at all the advertisers. You've got Nike and Coke, and, 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 and I don't even know all the advertisers. The, the, any commercial comes on, if you want to, to boycott, you've got to do all these different things. So while this principle is, is true, we've got to really ask ourselves, how am I even engaging this world? And a lot of us don't want to take the time to do that because it's hard. 
I had a family member who found out we were eating a Cracker Barrel the other day and got on the phone with me and, and asked me, don't eat at Cracker Barrel because they have terrible uh, labor uh, conditions for their workers. And I said, but what am I going to do without my mama's pancake breakfast? You know, can I not eat at Cracker Barrel without w worrying about the conditions in their factories? Can I buy my shoes without worrying about the conditions of the child in, in Singapore who is stitching it together? Does that matter? Sometimes we need to expand our view and say, what am I supporting even with my finances? Because as we support these things, we are, we in some way, shape, or form are contributing to what they are doing. Now again, that's a little bit beyond the scope of 2 John, but I think we ought to consider this, Christians. We ought to know what we're doing. We are not just floating through life being throwing money to different things. We make choices. Let us make informed choices. But zeroing back down into the scriptures, what he says is if you partake in what they are doing, if you feed them, if you let them spend the night, you are taking part in their evils. We need to be careful what, what we are teaching. This would also go if this was a church. If Paul, excuse me, if John was speaking not to a woman and her children, but to a congregation, it would be, you need to be careful who you allow to stand in this pulpit. If we have guests, if we have speakers, if we have people who want to come and present to you, I, as pastor of this church, our deacons uh, need to be very discerning on who stands behind this podium to declare truth to you. It matters. Because if you bring someone in who is giving off false teaching and you collect a love offering for them, you are sending them with more power and more might to go spread error. You need to be careful on the teachers you're listening to. Even if you're a believer, you need to be careful of the teachers' podcasts you're listening to, who you're watching on YouTube, who you're, who, whose products you're buying from some of the Christian networks. You've got to be careful. It's not unloving to care about truth and to care about protecting your family and about protecting your understanding of who God is. John said it like this, watch yourself, this is verse 8, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. At some point, you're going to be held accountable for what you have allowed into your mind, what you have allowed into the minds of your family, what you have allowed into the minds of the congregation. Are you going to honor what the disciples, what Christians throughout the centuries, what your grandparents, your parents, the teachers you've had have worked so hard to give you an understanding of who Jesus is, what salvation, what salvation means, how to have an eternity with him, what is written and honored in these words, are you going to throw it all away? Because you're not going to take the time to be discerning. We need to love one another, and love also means protecting the souls of one another. We need to love God, and part of loving God is obeying what He commands. And that we need to be alert on what the falsehoods around us are being shared. And don't take it lightly. There are, there are shows that my boys watch that I watch every single episode before I let them watch it. There are, there are things on television that are very engaging, but we turn them off because we say, we just can't have that. We will read reviews uh, from Christian commentary, or not commentaries, but Christian reviews and others that will tell us what is in a movie before we will allow our child to go and see it. Because we care about it. 
parents, I would encourage you to do the same. So brothers and sisters, we need to take that same care for one another. Are we aiding the spiritual growth of one another, or are we hampering it? In what we say, in what we teach, or in the way that we love or don't love one another. Let us be encouraging one another so that we may all receive the full reward. He finishes, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. It's just a desire that he would see them again. The children of your elect sister greet you. Again, to, to finish with the mystery we began with, this could be a sister church that, that is sending love to this other sister church, or it could be an actual sister of this woman saying, this, asking John to send along care from her to her sister. Whichever is true, they both communicate the fact that Christians should care for one another in love, in the truth, in commitment, in what we do and say, believe and behave. Let us honor Christ and love one another. Let's close together. Heavenly Father, as we've read these words, I pray that we could become more discerning people. That we would not let the random messages of this world enter into our minds. That we would be astute into the teachings of others. And that we would not focus on how many are listening to them or on how many stations of television their shows are on or how great or funny or engaging their messages are. But we would ask ourselves, is this truth? Is this what God's Word says? Is this based upon His Scriptures? I pray that our parents would engage with our children and ask them what is going on? What are they listening to? What are they watching? That we would become greater discerners of what is truth in a world that wants to say it doesn't even exist anymore. May we always cling close to the truth of the Scripture in the fact that we are sinners in need of a Savior and capable of meriting salvation on our own that we put our faith in Him so that we might be free from sin and its punishments and that one day too we would get to experience the resurrected life that only comes for those who believe in a resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. We praise you. We thank you.